Good morning and welcome to Leonard Christian Church. We're here to love one more. My name is Dave. I'm the preaching pastor here at Leonard Christian Church. We're so glad you've chosen to come join us this morning, whether it's here in person or if you're watching from home. We're so glad that we get to worship with you as we worship our great God. If this is your first time connecting with us, I encourage you, please fill out our online connect card, which can be found in the comments of the Facebook video, or you can go to LeonardRichristianChurch.com and click connect. For everyone that fills out the Connect card, we're giving $5 away to the New England Seafarers Mission down in Boston. So we'd love to give money away to great missions and ministry organizations. So if you fill out the card, we'll give 5 bucks away in your honor. And also, if you haven't done so, please like our church Facebook page, facebook.com slash London Area Christian Church. Uh, if you like our page and put, uh, put, put the three dots to say see first, whenever we post new information, whether that's uh, devotionals, uh, updates, videos, stuff going on. You'll see it on your newsfeed if you're on Facebook, so please do that. Also, some updates on some things that have changed uh, do, uh, as a part of our COVID-19 response plan. Uh, the first one is that we are now requiring you to wear a mask when you're in the building. Before, we strongly recommended it. Now, we require it. Everyone needs to wear a mask. It's just with case numbers going up, the weather turning colder, uh, we want everybody to be safe and as healthy as we can, so wear a mask. The second is we installed UV filters in our HVAC system, so hopefully any air that's being circulated in the building will, that may have any aerosolized virus will be inactivated by that. The next thing is uh, we've been asking you for the whole time we've been meeting back together to register before you attend, and so uh, everybody's been doing that. One thing we would like is if you register, but something comes up, either you're not feeling well or your plans change and you're not going to attend, if you can either email us or just go online to where you registered and cancel your registration, that way we know the, actually how many seats are going to be taken. We've had a few Sundays where it looked like we, were not, we didn't have any seats available for guests who may be coming in. 
uh, and we had some people who didn't end up attending that were registered, so we, it worked out. But that just helps us know uh, what's going on. Um, and also, if everybody could, could look up here, you see up here on the stand, there is the camera we use for um, uh, streaming our services. So that camera is not just a camera, it's also a microphone. So if you are in the vicinity of that camera, either before, after, or during service, and you're talking, your conversation is getting picked up by the camera. So just be aware, if you're around that camera and you're talking, don't talk about information you don't want shared with the entire World Wide Web because it's getting recorded. If the, camera, if the camera's not there, the phone's not there, it's not being streamed. So if it's empty, then you can talk whatever you want there. But if you see that there, just be aware it's being broadcast across the internet. So as we're here today, we're going to sing some songs together, we're going to study God's word together, and we're going to celebrate what Christ did for us through his death, burial, and resurrection through communion. So I encourage you, if you're watching from home, go ahead and get your piece of bread, uh, cracker, tortilla, water, juice, or uh, milk, whatever you have to have for later. If you're in the building, hopefully you grabbed your communion cup on the way in. If not, you got time to go do that so you can have that for later. Today we're continuing our series called Unleashed as we explore the person and work of the Holy Spirit. If you would, uh, please say the verse of the day with me. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. John chapter 16, verse 8. Let's pray. Father, may your spirit be at work in us today as we gather together around your son and your word. May your spirit be at work convicting us and drawing us close to you as we gather together around Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Mark Terry, and I'm the creative arts pastor here at LCC. I'm joined by Emma and Kevin this morning. Uh, we're going to start off by just singing some praises to God. So if you'd like to stand and sing along with us, you're welcome to do that. If you're more comfortable seated, uh, that's okay, too. Uh, but let's uh, sing some praise to God today.
presence, to be called your children. And we just want to lift up praise to you this morning. Give us ears to hear what you have to say through Dave. It's in your name that we pray. So we'll take a few moments as we start off again today talking to our kids who are hopefully watching from home. So hope you all are doing well. Uh, have any of you heard of or do you know what a GPS is? We had somebody, uh, first one of our kids who did, he said it had to do with maps, which was correct. So a GPS is a global positioning system. It works with satellites so that wherever you are, uh, if you have your GPS, it can tell you where you are and how to get where you're going. When uh, my wife and I first moved here to New Hampshire, we bought a GPS. We got a Magellan GPS that we put in our car uh, because when we were going someplace, we had no idea how to get there. Uh, where we lived, we grew, were living at the time in Illinois, and in Illinois, uh, the roads are laid out on a grid, a grid, people, where if you're going north and you turn right, you're going to be traveling east. And you will keep going east until the road stops. Unlike here in New Hampshire, where if you turn right, going east, you could wind up going southwest. Like, who knows? The road's going to go where it leads you, not where it's supposed to go. It's like, uh, you know, if you've been in Boston, you can see where you want to be, and you turn to get there, you never arrive. Because the road did not take you there. So we got a GPS, so we can know how to get where we're going. Now... Um, I use Apple Maps on my phone uh, instead of having a GPS on our car. It's now on our phones, and so that tells us how to get where we're going. Yesterday, I had to go out to Salem and bought some stuff off of Facebook Marketplace, and so I used my GPS to get to the houses to go buy the stuff because I hadn't been there before. Uh, so the, the GPS shows us the way to go. It helps us find our way. And did you know that God has given each of us, if you believe in and follow Jesus, We've all been given our own GPS, not on our phone, not on a special thing you buy, but in us now through the Holy Spirit, we have God's GPS that helps us find our way. If we need direction, try to figure out what to do in our life, how to make decisions, how we should go or what we should do, we have the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth, who helps us find our way. So today we're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit, how one of his jobs in guiding us takes place in our life. That's what we're going to dig in today. So thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for joining me to talk about God's GPS, the Holy Spirit that he's given us. So back in June, we started this series called Unleashed. And we've been looking at the person and work of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. We look at some amazing things the Holy Spirit does, that he unleashes us to build God's kingdom, that he empowers us with spiritual gifts. He seals us as his so that we know that we're part of God's family. He empowers us to live like Jesus. He restores us to life. He produces God's character in us. All those are amazing things the Holy Spirit does in us. And they're even more than just that. We're going to look at another one next week. But there's one thing the Holy Spirit does in us that may not seem as awesome. That when the Holy Spirit does this, it's not always fun or enjoyable. So have you ever had that feeling, that, that, that heavy feeling? Now, not heavy feeling as in like it's a day after Thanksgiving and you just <laughs> ate too much. But that heavy feeling, like the feeling like there's a weight just pressing on you. And no matter what you do, it doesn't go away. You try to distract yourself, like you, you start watching TV, or you clean the house, or you uh, go for a walk, or you read a book, or, or you talk to someone. No matter what you do, you just have this feeling of, of heaviness. And the reason you have it is because you did something you knew you shouldn't do. And you're experiencing an, a, uh, a part of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives called conviction. It's not fun, but it's necessary. And so the Holy Spirit, one of the, the roles the Spirit takes in our lives is the Holy Spirit convicts us. That when we do things we know we should not do, the Holy Spirit works to convict us. And we have this weight that's on us and like we can't get rid of it until we confess what we've done and repent. And that this 
action of the Holy Spirit called conviction, it's more pronounced, it's easier to recognize if you're a follower of Jesus, but the Bible says that this is true for everybody. That the Bible teaches that, that the Holy Spirit convicts the world, that everyone experiences conviction through the work of the Holy Spirit in the world, in the life of the believer. That everybody is and can be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at what Jesus says in John chapter 15. We're starting in John 15, and we're going to go into John chapter 16. John chapter 15, verse 26. This is when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you've been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you'll remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus tells us here. That God's going to send the advocate or the Holy Spirit to the disciples. And he tells them that this will be for their good. That it's for their good if Jesus goes away. Now there are times I read stuff in the Bible that I read it and I go, wait, what? Like Jesus says, it's for our good if he goes away. Now it's not a great idea to disagree with Jesus, but I want to here. Because he says it's better for him to go. I'm like, no, no, Jesus. It's better if you stay. If you stay, I can see you. I can talk to you. We can have lunch. Uh, we can hang out. Like, uh, I would much rather you would be here. But Jesus says, no, no, it's better for him to go back to the Father. Because when he does so, he can send the Holy Spirit. That when Jesus is here in person, he's one person. Imagine all of us trying to have lunch with Jesus at the same time. Like, who's he going to talk to? But now, when he sends the Holy Spirit, he can be present in each of us at the same time. And so Jesus says, I'm going away, and it's for your good, because I'm going to send you back the Holy Spirit, who will guide you into all truth. And the Spirit, as he's here, will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The first thing we see the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Look at John chapter 16, verse 9. It says, about sin, because people do not believe in me. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world about sin because people don't believe in him. So the sin that Jesus convicts the world of is the sin of unbelief. That the Spirit convicts the world of their unbelief, that they do not believe in Jesus, that they're not willing to place their believing loyalty in Jesus. That the sin that is convicted here is the sin of unbelief. See, here's what the Bible teaches us. The Bible says that the way for you to be saved is through grace by faith, or by grace through faith. Now, what that means is the way that we're saved is not by doing good things, not by going to church, not by reading the Bible or praying or giving money away, not by, you know, not doing bad things. Like where I grew up, if you were to be saved, the thought was you couldn't drink, smoke, chew, or swear. And if you did those things, then you can't be saved. 
That's not what the Bible says. It's not based on what you do. That the way that we're saved is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that when we place our believing loyalty in Jesus, saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for me, that you went to the tomb for me, that you were raised for me, and so I trust you with my life, that is when we're now able to be saved. That we are now putting our believing loyalty in Jesus. That we believe God's amazing love has been applied to us, and so we're now saved. At our house right now, in our hall closet, there is a Christmas gift that is wrapped and been in that closet since last Christmas. It'll probably be in that closet until next year at Christmas time. That it was a gift for someone that we expected to see last year at Christmas that we didn't. And so we kept it all wrapped, all ready and nice in the closet for this year, <laughs> but thanks to COVID, we're probably not going to see that person this year, so we're going to hang on to it till next year. Right now, that gift does no one any good. <laughs> it's just sitting in the closet. Whatever it is, I can't remember what it is, whatever it is, the person who it's for can't benefit from it because they haven't received it. And the same thing is true when it comes to God's amazing love that we find in Jesus. That God's love is available for everybody. And it's a gift for everyone. But in order to gain the benefit of that gift, people have to receive it. And so the Holy Spirit it comes and he convicts the world of sin, of their unbelief, so that they'll be moved to accept God's gift of grace and say, I want to follow Jesus. And so what we're called to do as followers of Jesus is that we live in such a way that demonstrates by our words and our deeds God's great love and his gift of grace so that other people will be convicted by the Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus. And some people in our lives will do that. We live and we, we go to church and we tell them about God, we pray for them, and they're gonna, they are they will hear the message of Jesus from us. And they're going to say, I want to follow Jesus, let's do this. And that's, that's great, that's what we want to see happen. But there are some people who have baggage and it's going to be harder for them to let the Holy Spirit convict them of their unbelief and move to belief in Christ it could be that they, they have had a bad experience with Christians or the church and they view Christians as hypocrites, as bigots as fools uh, as unkind or mean people that, that someone along the way has hurt them and so they've got that hurdle they have to get past for, for others it could be that someone told them the wrong story, that the way to be saved was about being good enough. And so they're trying all their life, all their energy to earn God's favor. There was uh, someone I knew growing up. We told him about Jesus, and he, he said, I can't come to church. I'm not good enough. It was like, dude, it's not about being good enough. But he believed if he walked in the building, it was going to collapse on him. So he would not go to church. He was told the wrong story. And so our role as followers of Jesus is to help people see and hear the story of Jesus and of God's great love in a way that allows the Holy Spirit to convict them of their unbelief and move them to belief. And so we keep living and sharing and being who Jesus calls us to be so that people can be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Not our job to convict them, it's the Spirit's job to convict them. The Spirit can convict them so they can move from unbelief to belief in Christ. The, the, the Word says the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. And the next thing we see, the Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness. Look at John chapter 16, verse 10. It says, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Jesus says the Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness. Did you know that... There used to be an actual metal bar that was used as the standard to measure a meter. So if you want to know how long a meter was, you know, the metric system, we don't use it here in America because we like to be different. The, the metric system of a meter is a unit of measurement. And so they had in Washington, D.C., at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they had a prototype of a measuring rod called the meter standard. It was a reinforced bar of platonium, uh, platinum, not platonium, 
That's not a word. Platinum. <laughs> alloy with exactly 10% iridium. And when they want to know the exact measurement of the meter, they cool the bar down to zero degrees Celsius at a sea level, 45 degrees latitude. Then they will know the exact tip-to-tip -tip measurement of a meter. That bar was known as prototype number 27 because the original was kept in Paris. So that's not how we measure a meter today. Now they use light in a vacuum and the speed of light and time and way more complex. Not that it wasn't complex before of like this bar with exact amount of metal at zero degrees at 40. Like, okay, anyway. <laughs> the whole point, there used to be a standard. If you want to know how long a meter was, they had an actual metal bar that at the right temperature, the right place, could tell you this is a meter. So why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Jesus is telling us that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness because Jesus is the standard. If you want to know what, what it means to be righteous or to live righteously, then Jesus is the one that we are measured by. He says he's going back to the Father that after his death and resurrection, that Jesus will return to the Father, vindicated as the righteous one, as the one who defeated death and sin without sin. And he is the standard for righteousness. So when we are convicted by the Holy Spirit for falling short of God's glory, then what is happening is that we are being convicted because we have not lived up to the standard of Jesus. So often, when you feel that weight or heaviness, of conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's not that you're being convicted of unbelief. You're being convicted because you do not meet the standard of righteousness that is Jesus. That you're not living up to Christ. Now, the good news, bad news. Bad news, that's going to keep happening. That we will all continue to fall short of that standard. Good news Jesus died for us so that when we fall short, we're forgiven. And even better news, the Bible says that not only will we be forgiven, but that when God sees us, he sees us as if we, as if we have met the standard. The scripture says that God made him, meaning Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what that means is that when God looks at us and we have made, we failed, we, we blew it, we didn't meet the standard, God looks at us and he sees it as if we did because Jesus has given us his righteousness. So now a way to think about this that maybe we can, we can uh, be practical is the, the idea of, of, of wearing different clothes. The idea is that because we don't meet the standard, our clothes are filthy and they're stained and they got holes and they're torn and they're just not good to wear. And so what happened for us is that God has taken those filthy clothes and placed them on Jesus. And now we get to wear the best clothes ever. Whatever your favorite brand of clothing is, that's what you get to wear. It's nice. It's clean. It's fresh. It's uh, awesome. And so when God sees you, that's what he sees. Not that you fail, but that in Jesus, the standard has been met. And so when we're convicted, often it's because we've fallen short of the standard of righteousness. And so the Holy Spirit works in us. And so our response when we feel that conviction is to confess our sin, repent, and keep following Jesus. The Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. The next thing we see, the Holy Spirit convicts of judgment. Look at John chapter 16, verse 11. It says, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit convicts of judgment because Satan now stands condemned. See, the Holy Spirit convicts of judgment because Jesus has been vindicated and defeated Satan. So one of the things the Bible teaches us is that there is a divine being who was created by God, who at some point rebelled against God, and this being throughout Scripture is known at times as the Satan, and that his desire is to thwart God's plan to co-rule creation with his divine and earthly family. 
So what God wants is to rule over everything with us participating in his divine rule over creation. That's what he says back in Genesis chapter 1. Go out, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. I put you in charge. You're going to rule this place. Take care of it. That is what God wants. He wants to rule with us over everything. This being, known as the Satan, saw that and said, I don't like that idea. I'm going to thwart that. And so he tempted humanity to define good and evil for ourselves. You know, the whole apple eating incident turned out quite terribly for all of us. That happened. So Jesus says the spirit comes and he convicts the world of judgment because Satan has been defeated. So how does this play out? What's he talking about? So part of what Jesus is telling us is that God's plan for humanity was that we would live lives that are more concerned with helping others, caring for creation and other people than for ourselves. The enemy comes in and seduces us into living self-focused, self-centered lives where we live, where we follow Satan's path for living. It's the path of me first. It's part of why our natural inclination is to think only and always of ourselves. When we think of me, me, me first, that's part of the fall that happened because we chose to follow Satan's path rather than God's path. And this leads to all kinds of awful things in our world. And it starts out in the small where I just choose me over someone else. So rather than helping somebody else, I do what I want. And it leads into bigger, bigger ways. Eventually, where you get into the, the grand scale of nations fighting nations in violent conquest because we want things that they have. All of that is the path of living Satan's way, where it's about me and what I want at all costs compared to what someone else may want or need. That's that path. Jesus comes and he shows us a different way to live. And he exposed that, that way of living. And Jesus shows that rather than to fight with the same tools that Satan or the world uses in that path, he showed us a different way. Jesus exposed the weakness of that kind of living. Jesus said, if somebody strikes you, don't strike them back. Instead, turn the other cheek. Jesus said, if somebody says, hey, carry my bag for a mile, you carry it for two. He said, if someone says, hey, give me your coat, you give me your coat and your shirt as well. That Jesus said, if someone does violence to you, you let it happen. He says, pray for your enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Die for others. Love as I have loved you. The Holy Spirit, when we live this way, convicts the world of judgment because we're showing them that the way of self-focused living leads to emptiness and despair. But the way of Jesus leads to life by giving up what we feel is our rights or our privileges. That we say, I will give this up on behalf of others. And we, we stand at this moment in history. We have this awesome uh, benefit to us now. That we can look back on thousands of years of church history and we can see how living the way of Jesus bears fruit and the way of Satan doesn't. We have story after story after story of those who've lived the way of Christ and, and made great change. People like Martin Luther King Jr. who took the path of nonviolence and exposed the errors of the world. People like William Tyndale who said people need God's word in their own language. And the king says, I'm going to kill you. And Tyndale says, that's fine because they need the word. People like the, the thundering legion, a legion of Roman soldiers who were told to uh, swear uh, allegiance to the emperor as God. And they said, no, we follow Jesus. And they were forced to freeze to death on a frozen lake of ice. Because they would not deny Christ. Now some would say, well, that's foolishness. And if you look at the, the path of the world, yes. But the path of Jesus says, no, they won the victory. The Holy Spirit comes into us and lives in us. And as we live the way of Jesus, the way of caring for others, of denying ourselves, 
of sharing God's love and God's truth. That as we live that way, the Holy Spirit does his work around us to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. That the calling of the believer is to live in such a way that what we do creates conversations. That you live in a way where by serving others, by giving money to, to uh, the work of God, by giving your time, by uh, just being the person God's called you to be, living the way of Jesus, that someone says, why do you do what you do? Why are you different? And so we can then respond. It's because God's amazing grace. Because God loves me, though I don't deserve it. Because God died for me, even though I don't deserve it. God did this for me, and it was a free gift that I received. And that then moves me to live like this, to live differently, where I can be who God wants me to be. That as we live this way, the Holy Spirit convicts the world so we can have conversations, tell people about Jesus. So that hopefully they can move from unbelief to belief. From death to life. From sin to righteousness. Not because we did anything except share the story. That's our hope. That as we live this way, the Holy Spirit will convict the world and people will move and, and place their believing loyalty in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have loved us. God, that you loved us when we didn't deserve it. God, that you give us your grace though we don't deserve it. God, that you're acting in us. And so God, we pray that you would help us live in your way. A way that is not self-focused or self-centered. A way that shows who you are. So that we can have these conversations and share about you. God, help us to be bold. Help us to be honest. And God, help us to share your love with as many people as we can. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, we're going to respond to today's message through song. If you'd like to stay and sing along, if you'd like to sit and pray, whatever you'd like to do.
in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul says that we don't view people the way we used to. And instead we recognize that we've been reconciled, we've been brought close to God through Jesus. And so God's no longer counting men's sins against them if they believe in and follow Jesus. And that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Every week, this time of communion is our time to remember what God has done for us. That God took him, Jesus, who had no sin, and became sin for us. So that we could be reconciled to God. If you're at home, you can grab your piece of bread or cracker or whatever you have. If you're here in the building, you can open up to the wafer on the top of the communion. And this bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us that we can be reconciled to God. Let's take it together. If you're home, you can grab your milk, juice, or water. And if you're here in the building, you can go ahead and open up the, the communion cup to the juice. And this juice represents for us the blood of Christ that covers us so that when God sees us, he sees Jesus' righteousness. Let's take it together. Every week we have an opportunity to respond to God's amazing love through giving. That we give, not because it's going to earn our salvation or buy us a ticket to heaven. We give because through our giving, we hope that one more person can discover God's amazing love. That through our giving, we can be sharing that message of God's grace with everybody. And so we can give by using our time and our energy to serve others. We can give by giving uh, part of our money back and giving it to the church so that the ministry of the church can continue as we seek to love others and share God's love with them. That all that we do here at LCC is meant uh, for the purpose of loving one more. That we can help one more person and one more person and one more person discover God's amazing love so they can place their believing loyalty in Jesus. There are a variety of ways you can give. As you leave today, you can place your offering in the giving box, or you can give online on our website, or you can set up online regular giving through your bank as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great and amazing love for us. That, Father, though we uh, are sinful, though we fall short of your standard, you love us enough that you sent your son to take our place. And so, God, I pray that what we give today will be used by you to help one more person uh, discover your amazing love, God, that one more person can move from unbelief to belief, can move from death to life, who can move from sin to righteousness because of what you've done for them in Jesus. Father, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As we close, again, I want to say thank you for joining us today. And a few reminders, if you haven't done so, if you could please fill out the online connect card. Uh, we'll get $5 away to the England Seafarers Mission for whoever fills out that card. Uh, also, there will be no uh, Wednesday night prayer this week on Facebook. Uh, so uh, that will be happening this week. But you can join us on Friday night, Friday night Devo at 8 o'clock on Friday on Facebook. But again, thank you for joining us today as we discover that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are acting through your Holy Spirit to convict the world. And God, help us to live in a way that spurs conversations that would lead people to place their believing loyalty in Jesus. So God, we pray that you would use us as we seek to love one more to help more and more people discover your amazing love. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week and keep finding ways to love one more. Woo